Welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. Today is April 22nd, 2020. The 50th anniversary of Earth Day is today. It's very appropriate. And uh, we're very, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Sean Gordon of Portland State University. And he'll be, as you see there, speaking about prototyping an open knowledge network for spatial, spatial decision support. Sean? Great, thanks very much, Ken. Um, pleasure to be here. And um, this Earth Day 50th anniversary kind of snuck up on me. I do a lot of work related to natural resources. And as you'll see uh, in the presentation here, our project, our prototyping project has, has focused a lot on natural resource themes. Um, it's a it's a bit of a letdown, I guess, this year, with the everybody pretty much locked in at at home. Uh, I've just read in the newspaper this morning. It's actually they say one of the largest secular uh, observations around the world, typically. So I'm going to be talking uh, about this theme of spatial decision support, uh, which is which is my specialty. I'm I'm actually not a, as I put in my bio, I'm not a working ontologist or an expert in knowledge graphs, uh, but rather I work in this field of uh, spatial decision support, which is essentially using uh, maps and data to help people answer questions and make more informed decisions. And there's a number of levels to this idea of spatial decision support. I imagine many of you have heard about geographic information systems, which are essentially um, mapping systems that allow you to combine data and maps. Um, and these are kind of spatial analysis platforms, fairly generic. You, you have to put together your own series of commands to analyze your data. Uh, a few examples are of these kind of software are listed there. And more specifically, uh, I work in the area of decision support systems, which simply combine data with some kind of model about how you analyze the data, and then a user interface that allows users to interact with that model and um, um, apply it to their particular problem. One of the, or a couple of the problems that we've encountered with spatial decision support systems and trying to share these among professionals is that most of the time they end up being designed as closed systems. And by that I mean they've got a number of components in them that are working together, but they're generally pretty tightly tied together. Um, in a, in a particular pattern to solve a particular problem, and uh, you as a user generally can't reorder those, nor can you often add new functions uh, to the process. And uh, beyond that, it's, it's difficult to combine specific decision support systems with others uh, to do combination of analysis that you may want to do. So that's one of the things that attracted us to this idea of semantic networks and the ability uh, to share and create more interoperable information. The project I'm going to talk about today uh, was funded by this new National Science Foundation program called the Convergence Accelerator. And their mission, as it says there, is to accelerate use-inspired, convergent research in areas of national importance. And by convergence, they mean across different disciplines, right? In academia, we've got pretty, uh, sometimes pretty rigid disciplines that go very deep. Um, and we know the problems of um, silos where, where people are in their own discipline and not 
sharing information effectively across disciplines. They also mean with convergence to converge different sectors of society uh, in partnerships, uh, most notably public and private partnerships with both industry, uh, nonprofits. And in 2019, the first year of this convergence accelerator, they focused on two ideas that come from this list of 10 NSF big ideas that were brainstormed in uh, 2016, I believe. And the two they chose for this first program were harnessing the data revolution and the future of work at the human technology frontier. And that has a lot to do with artificial intelligence and the effects that may have on the future workforce. Force. Um, but our project is in track A about the data revolution and they particularly call that the open knowledge network track. And they didn't, what they, they left this deliberately kind of vague what they meant by an open knowledge network. Uh, they didn't say that we need to use knowledge graphs or ontologies or any specific technology. They just uh, said that they wanted to foster networks that allow data to be located and shared um, uh, widely. And, and they did put in there at the end, understood at the semantic level, which uh, kind of pointed to their tendency or their, their read of the current direction um, of information sharing and this interest in ontologies and knowledge graphs. And, and in their explanations of this, they, they talked a lot about how knowledge graphs seem to be produced, uh, getting produced a lot in private corporations um, and that they wanted to help foster uh, more open access to this technology. So our piece in this um, ontology summit uh, was to talk about user needs. Uh, that was one of the themes, and that's what we really have the most experience in. And this NSF program is, has been pushing that very hard. They actually put us through a training program on an approach called human-centered design. Um, I think they did not uh, fully trust the uh, typical scientist to go out there and really assess uh, user needs well. Um, and they hired a consulting firm actually to do this and we've been doing exercises every month for the past nine months related to this theme. Uh, Human-centered design is a, a fairly open-ended concept. I've seen a number of definitions of it. Uh, but in terms of what this uh, firm has been emphasizing, are of course going out there and really talking to users, potential users, discovering what they need, uh, both through interviews and observation. Um, generating new ideas then, you know, uh, synthesizing across these interviews and observations and uh, trying to understand kind of the broader picture of what users need and try to brainstorm outside the box a bit and not perhaps directly address each need, but think uh, more broadly and, and, and more innovatively about what might be new solutions to these needs. Then a third part of their curriculum and what they've really pushed is, is making prototypes. And um, here they've, they've really pushed what they call low fidelity prototypes. And this is anything from your sketch on the back of a napkin uh, to uh, you know, Lincoln logs and Legos to actually what we might be more uh, used to with information systems, wireframes and um, uh, kind of uh, simple representations, prototypes on the computer. And the final aspect that they really emphasize in this is telling the story. Once you have your solution, uh, it's not enough just to put it out there, but you have to really explain it to people and, and uh, make it relatable in, in a story format. So in this uh, first phase of the project, a prototyping phase, we looked at what we call three case studies, three areas where 
members of our team are already active applying spatial decision support systems. Um, and we wanted to see what could uh, semantic technologies potentially bring to these efforts. Uh, one was on water quality in the Puget Sound area of Washington. Uh, one team was working on biodiversity issues in the uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, Cascade Mountains to coast area. And uh, a couple of others were working on wildfire issues, which of course have got a lot of attention recently, especially in California, um, in the Lake Tahoe Basin and, and in Santa Barbara. So our uh, boundary user needs assessment. Um, each of these case study teams engaged about 10, 10 to 20 users, generally professionals, working on these problems uh, in the region. Uh, it was through individual interviews uh, that sometimes were more formally structured uh, with a set of questions and through uh, group meetings that sometimes were just the the meetings of the particular group that we were working with, so more, more of an observational data gathering exercise. The, the basic themes were, uh, what are your main concerns and questions regarding the particular issue? And, and what are important resources for addressing those concerns or answering those questions? And where this format was used, uh, we found it to be fairly effective in allowing interviewees to then follow this pattern of, uh, of two issues, the concerns and the, the resources, and to kind of self-generate a number of um, uh, pieces of information that we could then uh, use in our later uh, semantic development. Uh, of course, we did some post hoc analysis uh, on these uh, interviews. And one of the things that uh, uh, one of our, our case study leads particularly emphasized was that we didn't want to go in trying to uh, generate a comprehensive ontology with these folks from the start, as some of us on the team had done in previous work, uh, because that can be obviously very labor intensive and takes quite a bit of time to generate uh, good ontology uh, structures and to think about being comprehensive in any particular application area. So rather, we wanted to try to start this in a more lightweight fashion, driven by particular uh, user needs or what we might consider comp competency questions. In terms of results, we came out with some 300 and some of these questions and concerns. Uh, here's a few examples. Uh, what are the effects of fire safe zone structures on risk? Uh, simulation of water quality changes. As you can see from just these few, the answers were quite heterogeneous. I suppose to be expected across a few different application areas and um, uh, done by a few different teams using somewhat different methods. But that, of course, presents a challenge uh, with, for synthesizing. We tried a couple different ways to synthesize across this information. Um, one was a more automated way um, where we uh, put, all these, put all these questions and concerns um, into a natural language processing environment. And uh, this was work done by the New Jersey Institute of Technology on our team. And they tested four different language processing models for um, relating these different questions and concerns into categorical groups. Uh, I won't go into detail on these different uh, methodologies, but uh, we can certainly provide more information on those to people that are interested. And you can see in the, the graph here is, is actually, you, you end up with pretty high dimensional data from this, uh, related word vectors. And uh, what they've done here on the graph is just reduce that using a principal components analysis to two axes. Uh, you can see a few groupings. Each one of those little dots is a different question or concern. And um, 
the shapes are relate to whether it came from the water quality, the biodiversity, or the wildfire uh, interviews, and the colors refer to the groupings. And on the right, you can see a few labels. Uh, those labels were were generated by one of our team members based on kind of the common set of keywords that came out of each one of these groupings. So it was kind of a manual naming at the end there. And what we're hoping to do here is discover new relationships uh, between uh, these cases. Of course, we're ultimately trying to boil these down into, into some kind of semantic format um, where we can answer uh, similar questions uh, provided with the information that, that we have. Uh, they also did some work. Let's see, did I keep the slide in here on yeah, linking these questions to uh, a literature database. So we had two literature stores. One was uh, from, from a few experts themselves, what they had gathered for literature on the particular topic. And another was the uh, New Jersey team harvested, I believe about 15,000 abstracts on water quality uh, from one of the major literature databases. And so they also put these through the language processing and were able to relate these. So you can see like if the, uh, the question up here at the top right is on what contaminants in the water are affecting salmon, uh, they could then try to pull out from these two different literature stores, what are the most relevant pieces of literature for that particular question. We also tried to do a, uh, a more manual synthesis of the, of the, um, the interview data. Uh, and that was, we started out with this transcribed interview data. We extracted uh, key, the key questions and concerns to spreadsheets, uh, along with the, the resources for answering those concerns. We imported those into a concept mapping software that some of our uh, team members have used before. And the idea here was to make this, the relationships, uh, make drawing the relationships more of a participatory process. Um, and uh, this concept mapping software allows uh, multiple people to participate in order to do that. And is just generally easier to use than your uh, standard ontology uh, development software. Uh, but at the same time, while we we're having people doing this matching between questions, between uh, questions uh, and other questions, and between questions and resources for answering those questions, we also had a team working in Protege, uh, the ontology development platform, uh, looking at what the people uh, with the uh, with the um, uh, concept mapping were doing and developing classes and relationships out of that. So in the end, this, uh, this, this work from the concept mapping software could be exported into a format that could then be directly imported back into Protege as an ontology and uh, instances. So here's a, a brief graphic representation of what the knowledge graph, uh, this pro prototype knowledge graph looked like in the end. There were really four domains of ontologies that were developed, these need to know questions. Uh, those are the actual interview questions, concerns, and, and resources themselves. Uh, there's what we called the P-Pod, which was a lot of these uh, questions have to do with, well, what other people and projects are working on the same issue I am? So uh, PPOD stands for persons, projects, organizations, and data sets. And then we had our uh, spatial decision support concepts about maps, uh, data, um, models to handle those data, analyze those data. And finally, uh, water quality concepts, which was the kind of the, the main subject matter of, of this particular knowledge graph. 
what we found was that there, a large time commitment was needed, not surprisingly, to um, put together this knowledge graph in a largely manual uh, fashion. Some of the uh, then kind of broader concepts that came out of this manual synthesis uh, were a set of common questions, um, some of which are, are clearly spatial, like what are the most important spatial factors related to issue X? These are, these are questions that cross the different case studies and domains. Uh, some are, are not necessarily spatial, like what are the current conditions relevant to A issue X and what data exist? But these are kind of the uh, generalized competency questions we probably want to be able to answer uh, for many of these uh, disciplinary applications and spatial decision support. So another uh, major aspect of our spatial decision support work is, is what geospatial data are available. That's going to be one of the major questions our users have. Um, and in particular, you know, what data are available relevant to a particular issue in a particular area and potentially for a particular time period. So one of our uh, team members from uh, Arizona State University has developed a geospatial web crawler that uh, crawls websites. And fortunately, there is a, a widespread standard out there called the OGC uh, standard for Open Geographic Consortium. Uh, and they have a way, uh, a standard for providing map services over the internet. So this tool can crawl the internet looking for those map services. And beyond just finding them, it uh, does a thematic classification of each service uh, because each one is going to have its own metadata, not necessarily developed to any kind of uh, taxonomic or uh, keywording standard, but rather usually freely keyworded. So the thematic classification of, of the metadata associated with these spatial data sets is important. Um, so she's designed a system that will uh, do a semantic classification according to uh, one or more common keyword taxonomies. Um, also, we'll take out the temporal data from the uh, metadata. And um, there's a couple different levels of that, like when was the data authored versus what period of time does the data actually cover if it covers a specific time period. And then finally, of course, what's the uh, spatial aspects of the data? Um, what's the area it covers? And is it represented often in, in um, semantic stores such as DBPD or GeoNames? Geographic areas are, are represented as points, and with spatial analysis, we're often more concerned with areas, and so that matching process can be somewhat of a challenge. A second aspect of uh, applying these semantic tools to uh, spatial decision support is looking at the actual tools, uh, models, and techniques that are out there to analyze spatial data. And for this, uh, we've developed a, a prototype spatial decision support knowledge portal, which consists of a, uh, an RDF store and an ontology server, where we've uh, taken a number of things, such as the analytical methods and tools, uh, and classified them uh, uh, into an ontology. Um, also have some work in there on data sets and data models, uh, more broadly on planning decision problem types and processes used in, in planning, and on um, a few case studies of how such tools have been applied in particular situations. A third aspect of uh, this work in spatial decision support is, is looking at actual uh, geospatial workflows because as we're putting together a spatial decision support system, it's often, there's a, a variety of operations that need to be chained together 
to get from your source data to your analysis product. And ideally, we'd like to be able to put this online in a more semantic format where people could take advantage of shared data across the internet and, and shared tools across the internet to do their spatial analysis. And again, uh, Wen Wen Lee from Arizona State University has uh, been developing a prototype tool in this field that uses a Q&A interface to try to uh, be able to answer complex geographic questions. One of the examples she's provided is what earthquakes occurred in California from January through March of any particular year. Um, you can see there that the, it's got key elements in any spatial query, which is uh, looking at the space to be analyzed, the time period uh, to be analyzed, the theme, in this case, earthquakes, and then the analysis rules, which are what are the actual analysis steps you're going to be providing. That's probably the uh, most trickiest piece of this and least developed uh, piece. Uh, analysis rules. So she's uh, developed a spatial operation ontology. There are a number of kind of common spatial operation standards that exist out there. Again, this open geospatial uh, consortium has created standards for some of these basic operations that are a good start. Uh, at, at doing this. So these rules each can be thought of as having a name, certain inputs and certain outputs, um, and then those can be potentially chained together to do more complex operations. So the, the idea here is that most data out there, geographic data, are not semantically enabled, so there's simply no knowledge graph that's going to answer the question about how many earthquakes occurred in California in, uh, in 2020. Uh, but if we can combine elements of semantic processing with elements of spatial decision support, uh, we can answer a much broader set of uh, questions for people. Here are just a few more graphics uh, of the workings behind that system you'll see on the left that uh, it takes a theme uh, time place names and then these analysis rules uh, to come out with a uh, processing uh, a processing flow and on the right side is just a, a more semantic view of the different ontologies that go into this production of an online semantic geospatial workflow So now in, in phase two, here's a few of the things that we're hoping to work on. Our phase two proposal is, is due in two weeks. Uh, so we're working hard on that right now. Um, first off is naturally uh, more automated tools for knowledge graph building. Uh, we realize that um, we need to uh, be able to ingest a lot more data a lot more quickly. Um, we need to do a better job of, of doing concept definition from existing material. Obviously, folks do this from Wikipedia or, or other sources to help uh, train their, their um, concept modeling. Uh, we need to um, then be able to better refine the data that we've collected on these use cases using the concepts. And of course, concept equivalence there is a major piece of that. How do we decide uh, which concepts are close enough to each other to be answered by the same question or be assigned uh, the same class in an ontology? Uh, we're also very interested in participatory tools for, for knowledge graph building. Uh, we very much wanna keep humans in the loop here and keep our stakeholders in particular uh, in the loop so they can have some control over the building of these knowledge graphs and geospatial workflows. So it really answers the questions that they want to answer and that they have some understanding of the tool so they have more trust in it and that, that they can contribute their knowledge uh, to this process. 
Uh, third, uh, we of course need to keep working on this automated resource discovery, uh, finding the data sets out there, finding the tools out there, being able to classify them in some uh, consistent manner uh, so we can incorporate them into knowledge graphs. Uh, the geospatial workflows, it's of course the one of the ultimate aims of this is to use these different pieces to enable those geospatial workflows that combine semantic and uh, spatial decision support uh, capabilities. And finally, as I mentioned briefly earlier, a lot of uh, the people we interviewed were very interested in, in simply trying to find out who else was working on what they're interested in and um, what they, uh, especially across different domains, right, across expertise and across different organizations because uh, people, especially at uh, public agencies, um, other decision makers are being pressed to make more integrated decisions about, uh, about our resources. And so they need to make contacts in other disciplines and other agencies and be able to put their information together. So that's it for my formal presentation. And uh, we would really appreciate uh, your questions and, and feedback on ideas of where we might go from here. Thanks, Sean. That was really very, very interesting and informative. Let's see. Todd, I guess, has his hand up. Oh, Todd, go ahead. Oh, hi, hi Sean. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm glad to see people are making practical use of this stuff. Um, <laughs> But um, I don't know if you have the chat window open for our, our meeting or SOPUB. If not, I can just read the questions. I have four of them. You don't necessarily have to answer any of them if you don't want. I would certainly appreciate any, any answers you have. The first one is, I understand um, the need to have human input uh, to develop these ontologies. And the, the fact that you didn't try and develop a comprehensive one initially is probably a wise move, obviously. But in the development of your ontologies, have you made use in any fashion and I quote that last part in any fashion of foundational ontologies. Um, no, I don't believe we have, although I've got a couple of team members on here too that uh, might be able to correct me on that. I wasn't deeply involved in the ontology construction part. So I don't know if they can uh, chime in here or do they need to, I assume they can just enable their microphones. This, I see uh, uh, Philip Murphy is on. Yeah, just unmute your. your uh, this is Philip Murphy here. Um, I was sort of the lead of the water quality effort, and again, as uh, Sean would say, coming in, I don't. I'm not an ontology expert. I just find myself running into them all the time. Um, and so, w when, as Sean um, showed you, sort of, uh, we thought about the ontologies in terms of what we call ontology frameworks. So right. we started with this thing called people, projects, organizations, and data sets, which was a particular uh, ontology that came out of uh, a group working in the Central Valley area. And we found out as a, an easy, an easy uh, starting point that would connect. Uh, Sean, did, I don't know if Sean sort of told you that, you know, this has been a six month project. <laughs> That's the entire oh, length of it. Um, and so um, this is an unusual NSF effort. And so, you know, after six months into this, we have to write our phase two uh, proposal. So a lot of this was sort of fast experimentation and quick usage. And so with the Peapod stuff, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the classes now that people, and, you know, what is a person and so forth, um, a lot of those were pulled from schema.org, I believe. Um, uh -huh we pull from where we could to make progress at speed. Okay. Um, but we are very cognizant of um, that, you know, experts like yourselves would probably look through uh, what we've done and have a lot of ideas on this. On the larger question of sort of, you know, foundational, I mean, uh, you, know, you know, like using the sweet ontology, for instance, just, you know, and start our science analysis there. One of the things that I think Sean mentioned to you is that, um, there's this constant tension all the time in that we're doing these interviews at high speed and we're using AI to help us transcribe them and then do various um, analysis around those to help identify what are the key questions and what are the key resources. Um, and originally, naively, we thought that we could, um, with a group of us uh, and others are much 
smarter than I on this stuff, uh, me, uh, we could sort of, you know, formally identify um, concepts in water quality to do, like, say, hydrodynamics and so forth fast enough that we could then um, establish those as classes and then pull in uh, instances from all of our um, gathered um, uh, digital artifacts. Um, but we found that process incredibly slow. And so we really, we made a lot of progress on the Peapod stuff. We developed these, this new class of things called need to know questions. Um, and we had our original SDS ontology that we tweaked a bit with things like data sets, et cetera. But we, um, we never really made a lot of progress on uh, the, like a fundamental thing, like actually the domain of water and water quality. Um, and so we're in phase two where we're, we're, we definitely went out and recruited some uh, he heavier people with more ontological capability uh, that, um, uh, as Sean said, we, our, our, our idea in phase two is that we're actually going to flood lots of stuff with a very light schema into the knowledge graph. And then after the fact, we're going to actually work at trying to figure out how to connect that to perhaps foundational ontologies or, or at least other work that's been done out there. Do you expect this work to persist in any, for any period of time, i.e. be reused for over years or decades? That's the very purpose uh, of it. Um, and Then you, know, you really need to take a look, step back and look and see how you can make use of these foundational ontologies because that sort of gets to the uh, fourth question I posted on the chat um, in terms of change management. Have you thought about how you might address change management? I realize you probably haven't done anything about that yet, but you must have come across situations where you said, oops, well, that's not going to work. I have to make this change. And this is regard in the context of the ontologies themselves, or maybe even just your, your knowledge graph. Somehow things got miscategorized because your word vectors weren't set up properly or whatever tool you were using, a uh, natural language process, processing tool didn't account for whatever you needed to account for. <laughs> Yeah, yes, uh, we we certainly encountered uh, the issue okay. of change management, uh, even at this oh, with a small yeah. group. <laughs> um, well, uh, and your your points are right on, and and we do uh, everything you've mentioned as things to do are exactly what we are want to incorporate in uh, phase two. Okay, well, um, and this is another open question to anyone on the call. I am not aware of any work in some of the natural language processing tools like BERT or GLOVE or some of the others that are out there that incorporate a foundational ontology in their basic schema. So if anyone knows about those, any use of that, uh, please post it in the chat. I'd be very interested. Uh, my last two questions are really fast and they're more technical. Uh, what format do you use for your rules? And then in relation to that or related to that is what reasoner or reasoners are you using? Because there's one block, 17 or is it 16, that shows the use of reasoners. Yes, this is so we, a great question for one one who I think is on here. Thanks. Hi, this is Yuan Yuan. So uh, I'm working for the ASU and I'm uh, kind of familiar with this work. So you're asking for the reasoners, uh, right? Uh, there are two reasoners. The first one is the uh, time reasoner, and the second one is the spatial reasoner. So uh, for the time, uh, let's say the temporal reasoning, we are using the uh, Stanford time tagger SU, SU time. So um, this is an open source library. So uh, for the uh, spatial reasoner, we are using the uh, DBpedia knowledge base. The D DBpedia has a reasoner? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm no, not sure no. where, yeah. So that, that is used for uh, the place, la place name and uh, place name disambiguation. Okay. But in, in the work we did ourselves, when we pulled the stuff into Protege, one, one, as far as I know, we never actually uh, ran a reasoner on it, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make sure I had things clear. Thank you. Uh, I'll let someone I, else I, ask some questions. I think one, one was, was, sorry, yeah. Yeah, okay. I yield to the next person, um, Kenneth. Well, the next person is John, John Sawa. Okay, hi. Uh, one of the things I hear from this is that change management, uh, integration of multiple sources and revision, these are the most fundamental issues in trying to put together any kind of an application. And this, these are areas on which the work on ontology has done absolutely nothing. The whole idea of the 
idea that if you adopt a foundational ontology, some magic will happen that will integrate everything. And that's absolutely the worst possible assumption because the number of ontologies out there is enormous and, then, and they're growing and they're growing uncontrollably. And the most important thing that we need to do is the, to integrate an open-ended variety of ontologies and computational tools, AI tools, standard databases, relational databases, graph databases. You have to integrate everything. And the big in issue in using ontologies is integration with legacy systems. There are trillions of dollars of legacy systems out there that will never go away. They've been there for 40 years, and every version of a, <clears throat> every revision to a legacy system is always upward compatible. They never revise a legacy system to go with anybody else's foundational ontology. The whole concept of a foundational ontology means a foundation for a silo. And what we want to avoid are silos. The only way to avoid silos is to focus on automated and semi-automated tools for integrating uh, independently developed ontologies with legacy systems and with tools of any kind. And these are issues for which we just don't have the tools. And the people who are focusing on foundational ontologies are just going up a dead end. Uh, and that's something that I've been uh, very concerned about for uh, the past few years. This, this standard for ontologies does not address integration. It does not address change management. It does not address legacy systems. It does not address uh, mapping smoothly to all the tools on natural language processing and searching and everything else. End of rant. That's serious <laughs> rant. Do you, do you have any questions, John? Well, the question I have is, uh, what kind of automated and semi-automated tools would these people like in order to um, put together all the sources that they have? If they had some sort of magic tools for integrating ontologies with natural language, with dictionaries, with uh, sources and terminologies that haven't been formalized, how would they use them if they had such tools? Yes. So such tools are available, by the way. They're still in a research stage, but people are not bringing them forward into the mainstream. Well, if, if we get our phase two grant, we'd certainly like leads on, on how to start testing some of those. Um, one ex okay, one example is formal concept analysis, which is an excellent way for pushing a button and automatically getting your ontology together. All you have is you put down a very simple uh, definitions of your terms and ter and you push a button and your uh, hierarchy is automatically created for you. And if you have multiple sources of these definitions from all sorts of statements, you throw them all in the pot, push a button, and magically you get an ontology. And that's the kind of thing that uh, that the formal concept analysis methods have been available for the past 20 years and people just haven't been uh, bringing them in. They're, they're not integrated with the uh, semantic network, although a lot of people who are using OWL do use formal concept analysis to check whether their OWL system is uh, consistent. And the thing is that best uh, application for it is to use FCA to show whether multiple, how multiple independently developed ontologies can be organized into a single big ontology. And that's uh, one of the most important tools for integrating anything. Well, fantastic. We'll uh, be looking for that. And Just look for any... FCA. Uh, okay. uh, uh, FCA, Formal Concept Analysis, and there's a, uh, a homepage on that uh, organized by uh, Uta Pris. Uh, who has been uh, putting together all these things. And there's free software that's available, and the software can be used to take any OWL ontology and check it for, uh, and check it for consistency. Or for that matter, you can take WordNet, push a button, and you get uh, and, and a complete uh, hierarchy of WordNet. You take uh, uh, Roger's thesaurus, you push a button, and you get a complete hierarchy for that. You take WordNet and, and uh, Roger's thesaurus and put them in the same box, push a button, and you get an ontology that, that includes both of them. Mm -hmm. 
Great. That's, fanta uh, this, that's fantastic. Uh, we, we, we intended to use uh, some of the, our New Jersey team's uh, ability to understand the equivalent uh, at a semantic level to take perhaps two independent um, uh, ontologies and start finding what the common nodes are between them with the same meaning. Uh, and, uh, it, but it's great to so, but what you're describing sounds fantastic. So we'd definitely be looking at that as well. Thanks. Okay. Yes. And the, the idea there is that each ontology, uh, each term is defined as a, as a, a set of attributes. Each attribute mm -hmm. is a monadic relation, or it could be a monadic relation that's attached to some other, uh, something else. So it would be a dyadic. So you just say that for every word in your uh, dictionary, you just have a list of uh, a, a list of features, and you and you can take multiple kinds of features that are independently developed, and you can discover by pushing a button. You can see that uh, when you build this larger thing, you see that some of these features actually turn out to be very similar because they're connected in very similar ways. And this is an excellent tool that. Uh, uh, has not that the ontology crowd has not taken up because they're still using OWL and uh, what you can with formal concept analysis you, you can use a subset of OWL and uh, anything in multiple things using the same subset you just push a button and you get a big ontology that includes all of them. Well definitely look into that I, mean, I think that could be a great compliment to what we were thinking of doing so okay thanks. take a okay, look at that. Um, <laughs> Ravi is next Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead, Ravi. Okay, thank you, Sean. Very, very good talk, very comprehensive. You have a good team of colleagues who are working with you. Let me begin with three or four observations and questions. It's excellent that you begin with earth science background, um, similar, but I have uh, for example, I have exposure to NASA DAX, Data Active Archive uh, Centers, for each earth science discipline such as water, oceanography, atmosphere, they have different decks. I did not see you mention much about that, and there is a set of metadata used by users for searching uh, subsetting those metadata to get the required data set. Of course, that is a very large global archive, active archive, dynamic archive, but I'm sure that there are NOAA and other sources. There are uh, drones, there are aerial sources now that probably supplement a huge amount of petabytes of data you eluded me uh, during your talk that you are having a team that does that metadata and the earth data search. Do you combine these in some uh, specific way so that you know how many data sets covering what time frames are over a spatial area? Uh, yes, we do. That's at that, um... Polar Hub tool out of Arizona State University. Uh, it does that and it does use the uh, global change master directory uh, taxonomy as part of its semantic classification of those different data sets. Does it include FDGC metadata and NASA metadata from DAX? Uh, it's, it certainly, I'm pretty sure it includes the metadata, um, are you talking about the, the taxonomy uh, behind the metadata? No, just the, uh, just the, frankly, the metadata are constructed probably using some kind of ontology or taxonomy in the background, but largely they are also dependent on technology parameters such as satellite, sensor, bandwidth and theme and so on, constructed image data products, et cetera. Yes, so I know the ASU tool uses uh, uh, some of the taxonomies developed. I, I mentioned that one, the Global Change Master Directory, and I think it 
can incorporate would be, others. It would be very nice if you could send us a link to that uh, Oregon State or whatever you mentioned. Yes, and it is actually in the presentation there. You'll see it. Uh, oh, okay. Thank I forget you. which slide, but the one on, on Polar Hub. And we are, there's actually okay. a whole, there's a few people on the project that are very interested in uh, digging down and making uh, satellite data more semantically available. Uh, so that's a whole other topic. Not only satellite, but also uh, ground truth in terms of drone, aerial, and actual ground data. Yeah, yep. Yeah. No, there's certainly a wealth of data out there, and it's becoming a, ever more difficult to uh, be able to access the data that you need and to even know what, what's available. Uh, I have two specific questions for your slides before I come back to the last. Uh, in your slides, uh, you know, the one where you cluster, um, let me, I don't, but if you remember the interactive question, category visualization. Yes, I'll put that up there again. Where you are using four different NLP search engines or whatever, BOW, etc. I don't know about those much but using different tools, you get this beautiful clustering. I see some patterns in colors. What do these patterns indicate? Those patterns indicate the, uh, how close the, the words in the different uh, questions. And um, so these were the, the questions and concerns from the interviews and the resources that people identified that might answer those questions and concerns. So there's two types of information in here. Um, and what this shows is how a natural language processor would sort those into uh, different categories. So how close one question is to another question or to a resource. And they, they vary a bit in terms of how much uh, semantic uh, context information they use in, in doing the natural language processing. So some are just like that first one's a bag of words approach and it, it simply uh, does word counts. It doesn't really pay attention to the semantics of the words while the, the later ones in the list do. So this is just one example. I think this was the BERT sort, but uh, if you, so this was just one uh, one methodology, the result of one methodology. If I show you the other methodologies, they'd look somewhat different, the results. So would you, suppose you were to use BOW or TVF, IDF, you would get a different cluster? That's right. Okay, then also it is dependent on the vocabulary contained in the questions versus matching metadata in the source of data. It's a very complex mapping. Uh, suppose the questions were so naive that they missed out most of the detailed vocabularies in the data sets, then they would probably get a different kind of cluster. Yes. See, what I'm trying to say here, Sean, is that there is a social uh, network, uh, community participation, which is a little, to me, appears to be a softer area versus matching that to the actual data sets and repositories. So that brings me to a bigger question of how that NSF convergence acceleration project is uh, concerned with utilization of the actual earth science data sets or spatial data sets. Yes, I'd, I'd say they're very concerned. I mean, this is uh, the NSF program that is most concerned with end user results that I've ever seen. Um, very good. Okay, so, so then, then there is hope that when you end up with phase two, with constructing knowledge graphs, that there would be increasing use of that data, which often lies dormant in these petabyte repositories. Yes, that's very much our goal. 
Okay, two slides down from where we discussed this cluster is the map of different ontology frameworks. And I see no overlap. So maybe I don't understand something here. So kindly tell me how you are able to so cleanly delineate these ontology frameworks. Well, I think there definitely is overlap there. Uh, maybe I'll let Philip jump in again and talk a bit more about uh, the connections there. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what I understand what you mean by overlap in the sense that um, uh, you obviously can't see it because there's no water, for example, the water quality or WQ domain ontology framework has no overlap with these other ontology frameworks. So well, that's are you creating vocabularies uh, uh, or I mean a definitions and terms and vocabularies for only one area out of these four ontologies? One at a time. Uh, um, so as you, uh, it's hard to see there, but there there are uh, there are connections across all of these. Um, for instance, an ontological framework. No, I, a, yeah. I see the uh, connections between entities and this, mm -hmm. but you know I cannot visualize, for example, the water quality overlap with PPOD. Oh, um, natural separation, yeah. or is this artificially created? This is an artificial on the fly creation as we try to um, progress uh, uh, in the couple of months we had available to us. Um, but and in, in fact, real life, you would expect that the WD, WQ ontology would kind of spread over these other three. If oh, yeah, that it, is our subject mm -hmm. area of concern. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, the water quality domain ontology is massively bigger than the other three. So this is a highly, um, distorted uh, graph here, but it should okay. Th sort of- Thank yeah. you, I mean, it yeah. was not clear to me, but thank you, I, I think I get it, <laughs> that there is a master ontology on top of this. I don't know if it's the same foundational ontology that my colleague Todd refers to, but that's okay. Uh, no. He can answer, he can ask that question. Now, um, so the, the last, uh, question is, when will we see knowledge graphs? Perhaps end of phase two or what? Uh, we should, uh, we're hoping by the end of phase one, which is um, wraps up in, well, actually the boundary changes, but in about th two to three months, um, phase one will officially end. Uh, Sean could give more accurate dates. Wonderful, we, we right. would like, uh, at least if, if Ken and everybody else agrees, we would like a come back at least uh, if by the time our summit or maybe a little later uh, to follow on with this great work. Uh, we'd love to, yeah, we'd love to publish the, uh, our, whatever we've done, no matter how d dumb it may look and get your feedback on it, it would be tremendously helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, follow up Thank later in so the summer much. would be great. Um, Thank you, I think Janet has her hand Janet up. Janet has her okay. hand up. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, the, uh, don't be intimidated by the fancy Greek word ontology. Um, uh, I've seen more and more, I've seen people with long term experience in the field saying, I prefer to use the word rules, or I prefer to use the word schemas, or conceptual schemas, or conceptual models, or um, world models, or, um, you know, that's one of the unsettled questions in the ontology community is. Um, just what is an ontology and is the word ontology helpful? So um, there, I think the middle out kind of work that you people are doing is really helpful for us to, um, to do some human centered design on ontology to see what the actual uh, user needs are. And um, as John said, the, um, you know, we, we want to know what your, um, what you would like in a magic tool, um, you know, the integration, interoperation, um, you're not able to mandate that everybody use, um, you know, one grand ontology. So you have to um, work with these uh, heterogeneous sources of conceptual models as well as um, heterogeneous sources of data. Um, so it, it's exciting to see, but um, I, you know, I encourage you to, um, to, not be intimidated and um, you know, maybe you can help 
frame some of the key ideas and that would be a good, um, you know, the, the key challenges that would be a good output from your project. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's really been our focus is on uh, user needs. Um, and that's where our, uh, much of our expertise lies is in this kind of disciplinary or really cross-disciplinary, but it's a, a spatial decision support application. And so we're, of course, very excited about the semantic technologies and have been uh, dabbling in them for years and uh, really think there's a, a lot of potential to combine those, uh, combine these two, the uh, knowledge. There is, but, but we do need, um, we need sharper focus, as John was saying, on what the um, people like you who are, who are applying the semantic technologies what would you like if you could have, um, you know, your ideal support? Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, that's why I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with this group. So to have a chance to start that dialogue and I hope we can continue that. Great, thank you very much. We've reached the end of our hour. Uh, I want to thank you and Philip and all of your team for a really wonderful use case. I think um, yes, yes. hopefully a number wonderful of us will be able of to. Wonderful use cases, uh, yeah. Ken. We, we would hope that More. some people here today will um, be motivated to assist you in your efforts. And um, meanwhile, I'd like to invite everyone to come next week when uh, Christoph Janovich is going to be speaking. And so 